can do all kinds of fancy stuff with reinforcement learning. Right? So, the crux in reinforcement learning is that uh, the agent is going to, now this is learning agent, right? it is going to learn in a close interaction with an environment. Right? So, the environment could be the helicopter, it could be the cycle right? and uh, or it could be your backgammon board and your opponent, all of this could constitute the environment, a variety of different choices. So, you sense the state in which the environment is in, right? you sense the state of the environment okay, and figure out what is the action that you should take in response to the state. Right? So, you apply the action back to the environment, this causes a change in the state. Right? So, now comes the tricky part. Right? So, you should not just choose actions that are beneficial in the current state, but you should choose actions in such a way that they will put you in a state which is beneficial for you in the future. Right? Just, just capturing the queen of, uh, of your opponent is not enough in chess. Right, that might give you a high reward, but it might put you in a really bad position. So, you do not want that, right? You really want to be uh, uh, looking at the entire sequence of decisions that you are going to have to make and then try to behave optimally with respect to that, right? So, what do we mean by behave optimally in this case, right? We are going to assume that the environment, right, is giving you some kind of an evaluation. It is like falling down hurts, right, or capturing a piece maybe gives you a, a small plus 0.5 or winning the game gives you like 100, right? So, every time you win, every time you make a move or every time you execute an action, you did not get a reward or you did not get an evaluation from the environment, right. So, it could be just 0, it could be, it could be nothing. Right? So, I should point out that uh, this whole idea of having an evaluation come from the environment is, is just a mathematical convenience that we have here. Uh, but in reality, if you think about uh, biological systems that are learning using reinforcement learning, Right? All they are getting is their usual sensory inputs. Right? So, there is some fraction in the brain okay, that sits there and interprets some of those sensory input as rewards or punishments. Right? So, you fall down, you get hurt. I mean, that is still a sensory input that is coming from your skin. Right? Or somebody pats you on the back, that is still a sensory input that comes from the skin. Right? It is just another kind of an input. Right? So, you could choose to interpret this as a reward right? or this as a collision with an obstacle. Right? If something is brushing against my shoulder, let me move away. Right? Or you can just take it as somebody is patting my back, so I did something good. Right? So, it is a matter of interpretation. So, this is a, this whole thing about having a state signal and having a separate evaluation coming from the environment is a fiction right? that is created to have a, clear, a cleaner mathematical model, but in reality things are a lot uh, messier, you know, you do not you don't have such a clean separation, right. And uh, like I said, uh, so you have a stochastic environment, you have uh, delayed evaluation, noisy. So, the new term that we have added here is, huh? noisy. Noisy. No. scalar. The new term we have added here is scalar. So, that is one of the things with uh, the classical reinforcement learning uh, approaches. He said, I am going to assume that my reward is a scalar signal. Right? So, we talked about getting hurt and uh, having food and so on and so forth. What will all of this will happen mathematically is I will convert that into some kind of a number on a scale. Right? So, getting hurt might be minus 100. Right? Getting food might be plus 5. Winning the game might be plus 20. Right? Capturing a piece might be plus 0.5 or something like that. So, I am going to convert them to a scale. Right? And the goal is now, now that I have a single number that represents the evaluation, the goal is now to get as much as possible of that quantity over the long run. Okay? Make sense? Right? So, if you have questions, doubts, stop me and ask. So, mathematically, a scalar is easier to optimize. Uh, not necessarily, right? I'm just talking about. Uh, so it's it's like a cost function if you want to think about it in in terms of in terms of control systems, right? So this is like a cost, and I'm trying to optimize the cost, right? And uh, so if the cost is going to be vector value, then I'll have to start trading off one one uh, direction of the vector against the other. So which component of the vector is more important? So then it get into all kinds of uh, so Pareto optimality kind of questions, and so it's not really clear. Uh, what exactly is optimal in such cases, right? So, in fact, later on, I, we have a homework exercise for you to argue for and against scalar rewards. So, you can put down your thoughts then, right? Uh, so, 
here again let me emphasize it's not supervised learning right in supervised learning this is essentially what you're going to see there will be an input and there will be an output that you're producing and somebody will be giving you a target output okay so this is what you're supposed to produce and essentially you compare the output you are producing to the target output right and you can form some error signal right and you can use that error in order to train your agent right you can try to minimize the error you can do gradient descent on the error or you can do variety of things and you can try to train the agent so here i don't have a target i do have to learn a mapping from the input to the output but i don't have a target and hence i can't form an error right and therefore my trial and error becomes very essential so if i have errors right i can form gradients of the errors and they can go in the opposite direction of the gradient of the error right and then that will gives me some uh, uh, direction in which to change my parameters right that constitute the agent right my agent is going to be described in some way right the error gives me a direction right but now since i i don't know a direction right so i just i do something i get one evaluation so i don't know whether the evaluation is good or bad right so think of writing an exam right i don't tell you the right answer i just tell you three right and so what do you do now do you, are you happy with the answer should you change it should you change it in one direction or should you change it in the other direction see what makes it even more tricky is i don't you don't even know how much the exam is out of so when i say three it could be three out of three right it could be three out of hundred right and or it could be like three out of 18 which is what the class average in ml in the first quiz uh, right uh, so it could be any of these uh, things right so you don't even know whether three is a good number or a bad number so you have to explore to figure out a if you can get higher than three right or three is the best the second thing is okay if i can get higher than three how should I change my parameters to get to become higher than three? Right, so I have to change my parameters a little bit that way. Okay, I have to change the parameters a little bit this way. Right, so if I'm cycling, right, I have to push down a little harder on the pedal. Okay, or I have to push down a little softer on the pedal to figure out whether I'm staying balanced for a longer period of time or not. Right, so I don't know that otherwise unless I try these things, I wouldn't know. This is why the trial and error part. So if I push down a little harder and I stay balanced, maybe I should try pushing down even more harder next time, right? So maybe that will make it better, right? And then there might be some point where I tip over, so I need to come back. So these are things which you have to try. Unless you try that, you don't even know which direction you have to move in, right? So this is much more than uh, just the psychological aspects of trial and error. There's also a mathematical reason. If you want to adapt my parameters, right, I need to know the gradient. Okay, so that you need to do this. Right? Yeah? Uh, the reward is the one that uh, uh, you know that gives you the evaluation for the output, right? So here, uh, in the supervised case, the error is the evaluation for the output. If the error is zero, then your output is perfect, right? But then you have a way of gauging what the error is because you have a target to which you can compare, right? And from there you get the error. So in the reinforcement learning case, the evaluation is directly given to you as the uh, the evaluation of the output, right? It's not necessarily comparing against a, a target value or anything. You don't know how the evaluation was generated, right? You just get an evaluation directly. So you, you just get some number corresponding to the output. Right? So maybe I should have done put an arrow from the top saying evaluation comes in from there, but, uh, but that's exactly where it's coming. It's a substitute for the error signal, but it's just that you don't know what the evaluation is. Of course, the way it differs from the error is uh, minor differences. You typically tend to minimize error, but you tend to maximize evaluation, right? Uh, it's also not unsupervised learning. So unsupervised learning has some kind of an input, right? That goes to the agent and then it figures out what are the patterns for the, in the input, right? Here you have some kind of an evaluation and you are expected to produce an action in response to the input. It is not simply pattern detection, right? So you might want to detect patterns in the input so that you know what is the right response to give. But that is not the primary goal, right? But in uh, unsupervised learning, the pattern detection itself is the primary goal. So that is the difference, right? So here is this one slide, which I think is uh, kind of uh, the soul of reinforcement learning, right? Um, it's called temporal difference. So I'll, I'll, I'll explain it a little more detail in a, in a couple of slides. 
uh, but the intuition here <coughs> right so if you if you remember the pavlov's dog experiment right what was the dog doing it was predicting the outcome of the bell you know if the bell rings there is an outcome that's going to happen it's predicting the outcome which is food is going to happen and then it was reacting appropriate to the outcome right so most of reinforcement learning you're going to be predicting some kind of outcome that's going to happen see so if am i going to get a reward if i do this or if I, or am i going to not get a reward right am i going to win this uh, game if i make this move or am i not going to win this game right so i'm try, trying to always trying to predict the outcome right the outcome here is the amount of reward or punishment i'm going to get right so this is essentially what i'm trying to predict at every point right so the intuition behind uh, the, what is called temporal difference learning is the following right so the prediction that i make at time t plus 1 okay of what will be the eventual outcome let us say i'm playing a game right i'm going to say okay, i'm going to win now okay, i'm very sure i'm going to win now right so i can say that with a greater confidence when i'm closer to the end of the game than i can at the beginning of the game right so i have all the pieces set up right if i'm going to sit there then and say i'm going to win the game right it's most probably wishful thinking right but then you have played the game for like uh, 30 minutes or something and there are like five pieces left on the board now i'm going to say i'm going to win the game now i say i'm going to win the game right that's a much more confident prediction than what i did at the beginning right so th taking this to the extreme right so the prediction i make at t plus 1 is probably more accurate than the prediction i make at t correct the prediction i make at t plus 1 is more accurate than the prediction i make at t so if i want to improve the prediction i make at t what can i do i can look go forward in time right and basically go to the next uh, let the clock tick over and see what is the prediction i'll make at time t plus 1 with the additional knowledge i'm getting right i would have moved one step closer to the end of the game so i know i know is little bit better about the game right i don't know how the game is proceeding i know i can may now make a prediction about whether i'll win or lose right and use this go back and modify the prediction i make at time t right at t i think there is a prob possibility of say probability of 0.6 of me winning the game okay and then i make a move then i find out that i'm going to lose the game with a very high probability then what will i do is i'll go back and reduce the probability of winning that i made at time t so instead of 0.6 i'll say okay maybe 0.55 or something right so next time i come to the same state as i was at time t i won't make the prediction of 0.6 i'll say 0.55 right that's essentially the idea behind temporal difference learning right so it has a whole lot of advantages we'll talk about it uh, uh, a couple of slides down uh, but uh, one uh, one thing is it had a significant impact in uh, behavioral uh, psychology and in neuroscience right so Uh, it's uh, widely accepted that uh, animals actually use some form of uh, temporal difference learning and in fact there are specific uh, models right that uh, that have been proposed for temporal difference learning which seem to explain some of the uh, neurotransmitter behaviors in the brain yeah so suppose we are uh, playing a game and we have 10 moves that we can make and out of 10 we will select the best one mm -hmm. okay this is the usual scenario yeah. so No, 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 no. See, at this point, I'll be making a prediction about what is the probability of winning, and it could be for each of the moves. Right? If I make this move, what is the probability of winning? If I make this move, what is the probability of winning? Let us say I, I I make move two, okay, and then I go, I see a new position, right? My opponent responds to it, and then I decide, oh my God, this is a much worse move than I thought earlier. So what I'll do is I'll change the prediction I make for move two in the previous state. You see that the other other moves will not be affected because the only move I took was two. Only about that move I have additional information. Therefore, I can go back and change the prediction I make for move two alone. Okay. So you, you, you still have the ten moves. So you're not changing any of that. Yeah. So I'll be okay. going back and like changing the entire thing again, or just changing the prediction. Changing the prediction. It's not like I mean, if, uh, in an ideal world, you should be able to take back a bad move. right except if uh, if it's a parent playing with the kid i don't think uh, those things are allowed right uh, in fact when i play with my son we have sometimes had to rewind back all the way to the beginning it will probably be me asking to do the rewinding not him because he'll be drubbing me in some one of those games but uh, yeah 
otherwise you can't you just make the change the prediction so next time you play the game you will be better at it at not for that game well basically uh, you are you are messed up or you did well i mean so whatever it is yeah uh, uh, looking at uh, rl right so let's look at tic tac toe uh, <clears throat> how many of you have played tic tac toe good oh yo, even you put your hand up okay good uh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, good. Uh, so, so in tic tac toe, so you have these board positions, right? And uh, so you make different moves. So in the first, this is what I have drawn here is called a game tree, right? So I start off with the initial board, which is empty, right? And there are um, how many possible branches there for people making moves? Nine possible branches, right? For excess move, there are nine possible moves. So I have nine possible branches, and then for each of these. Uh, I'll have like eight possible. Uh, I'm not sure which is the right TV. Huh? For each of this, I have eight possible branches, and they keep going, right? So what we are going to be doing is uh, essentially uh, trying to uh, let's formulate this as a reinforcement learning problem. So how will you do this as a reinforcement learning problem? Right? So I have all these board positions, right? Let us say X is the reinforcement learning agent, and O is the opponent, right? So initially, given a blank board, I'll have to choose one among nine actions, right? So the the state that I'm going to see is this black, the the axis and O's on the board, right? And the moves I'll be making are the actions, right? So in the initial position, I have nine actions. I make that. Do I get any reward? Not really. There's no natural reward signal that you can give. Essentially, the reward that I'm going to get in this case is if at the end of the moves, if I win, I'll get a one. If I don't win, I get a zero. And if I win, I get a one. If I don't win, I get a zero. Right? So what is going to happen is I'm going to keep playing these games multiple times, right? And at each point, right? Um, yeah. Okay. So there is a note here. So what does that uh, note say? We have to assume it's an imperfect opponent, right? Otherwise, there's no point in trying to learn tic tac toe. Why? will always draw and the way we have set up the game you are indifferent between drawing and losing so you learn nothing i mean basically so you will not learn, even learn to draw okay you will just learn to yes. nothing basically you learn nothing because you can never win right so you are never going to get a reward of one so you will just be playing randomly so it's, it's it's a bad bad idea so let's assume that you have an agent that can that is imperfect right that makes mistakes so that you can actually learn to Figure out where the agent makes mistakes, where the opponent makes mistakes, and learn to exploit those things. Okay, right? So your states are going to be these board positions, as you can see. We give you a game that has been played out on the top of the slide, right? And the actions you take are in response to those board positions. And finally, at the end of the game, right? If you win, you get a one. If you don't win, you get a zero, right? Is it clear? Sir, in cases like this, I mean, does it have to be a binary sort of a reward system? I mean, could you have a scale where there, there are three parameters? If you lose, it's zero. If you draw, it's one. If you win, it's one. Sure. You could even do other things like if you win, it is one. If you lose, it's minus one. Ah, so, so then couldn't you have a perfect opponent and learn? Uh -huh. and take that uh, yeah, you possibly could, but you probably have to play a lot, lot and lot of games because the perfect opponent it's almost impossible for you to start getting any feedback in the beginning right you'll always be losing so it's going to be hard for you to learn but you'll eventually learn something yeah it'll take a lot of moves you'll eventually learn something if i say that at every point yeah so uh, when you're learning like at a particular stage the probability of winning and pro like uh -huh. when you update the previous yeah. state mm. so uh, you're storing information for you're storing information for each and every state that you have entered, right? Mm -hmm. So how will it be different from exploring the uh, prop, uh, like state space every time? Because uh, after you've done, let's say, a thousand a thousand games or a million games, you'll you will have explored a lot of states and you'll have to store for each state the probability of you winning at that point yeah. and all that. So how will yeah. that be different from exploring it again? Like, uh, why would like, I, why would, if I know the probability of winning from there, why would I have to explore it again? Uh, no, uh, I'm... Uh, Let's, let's, I'm not even told you how you are going to solve it. Okay, let me explain that, okay. and then you can come back and ask me these questions. Okay, if you still have them. Okay, uh, okay great. So what the way we are going to try and solve this game is as follows. Right, for every board position, I'm going to try and estimate 
the reward I'll get if I start from there and play the game to the end. Right? Every board position, I'm going to look at the reward I'll get if I start from there and play till the end. Now, if you think about it, what will this reward connot connotate? Right? So, if I win from there, I'll get a 1. If I lose from there, or if I don't win from there, I'll get a 0. Right? When I say, what is the reward I expect to get st starting from this board position? Right? It's essentially this average over multiple games. It's some games I'll win, some games I'll lose, I, or I'll not win. Right? Some games I win, some games I'll not win. So what will this expected reward represent after, after having played many, many, many games? Like the, probability. the probability of winning, right? right? The, the reward is going to represent the probability of winning in this particular case. Right? If the reward had not been 1, Right, if it had been something else, if it had been plus 5, right, it would have been some function of the probability of winning. Right? Or if it had been plus 1 for winning, minus 1 for losing and 0 for draw, well, it's, it's something more complex. It's no longer the probability of winning. Right? It's, it's the gain I expect to get. Right? How, what fraction of games I expect to win over the fraction of games I expect to lose or something like that. Right? It becomes a little bit more complex. So the, there could be some interpretation for the value function. But in general, it is just the expected, expected reward that I am going to get starting from a particular board position. Okay? So that is what I am trying to estimate. Right? Let us assume that I have such a expectation well defined for me. Right? Let us say I have such an expectation well defined. Right? Now I come to a specific position. Let us say I come, I come to this position here. Right? Let us say I come to this position. How will I decide what is the next move I have to make? <coughs> Sorry? Whichever next, state has Whichever next state has the highest probability of winning. So I just look ahead to see okay, where if I put if I put the x here, right? If I put the x here, what is the probability of winning? If I put the x here, what is the probability of winning? If I put the x here, what is the probability of winning? Right? I do this for each one of these, right? And then I figure out whichever has the highest probability of winning and I will put the x there. Right? So that is how I am going to use this function. Does it make sense? Yes? It is very important. So this is, this is something which you should understand. This is the crux of all reinforcement learning algorithms. Right? I am going to learn this function that tells me if you are in this state, right? if you play things out to the end, what will be the expected payoff that you will get, right? whether the rewards or punishment or cost, whatever you want to call it, what is the expected value you are going to get and when I want to behave according to a, this uh, learnt function, so when I come to a state, I look ahead, figure out which of the next states has the highest expectation and then go to that state, okay? great. How do I learn this expectation? What is the simplest way to learn the expectation? Yeah, this is essentially you keep track of what happens, essentially you keep track of the trajectory through the game tree, right? you play a game, you go all the way to the end. right? So you keep track of the trajectory and if you win, right? you go back along the trajectory and update every state that you saw on the trajectory, you update the probability of winning. Right? You just increase it a little bit. Or you come to the end of the game and you found that you have not won. Right? You go back along the trajectory, decrease the probability of winning a little bit. Right? Alternatively, you can keep the history of all the games you have played so far. Right? At every, after every game has been completed, you can go back and compute the average probability of winning across the entire history of all the games in which you saw that particular position. Right? Make sense? That is the easiest way of estimating this probability. Right? But the problem with this is A, you have to wait till the game ends right? or you have to store the history of all the games you have played. Right? I mean, All of these could be potential drawbacks. Okay, you can get around the history part by coming up with an incremental rule. But the main difficulty here is you have to wait all the way to the end of the game right? before you can change anything along the way. So tic-tac-toe is easy. It's like how many moves can you make in tic-tac-toe at best? Six. Four. Right? The fifth one is determined for you. 
right so it's basically four choices that you can make right uh, so and uh, that's easy enough to remember right you can always wait till the end of the game and then you can always make the updates right but what if it's a much more complex uh, situation right what if you're playing chess maybe you can wait till the end so what if you're cycling maybe you can wait till the end huh? exactly <laughs> we don't know right it depends on where you are cycling if you are cycling learning to cycle in iit madras it's fine but if you are learning to cycle somewhere on sardar patel road you don't want to even think about what end is there right so 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 there's a, there are some tasks for which you really like to learn along the way right so this is where td learning comes into comes to help right i don't think i have that slide anyway uh, and i'm not using the fancy thing where i can draw on the uh, on the projection so let's see if i can do it here right um suppose i have come here right and from here i have played I, at this point i know the probability of winning is say 0.4 right so i came here by making a move from this position so i said we were here right and we made a uh, we, we know that the probability of winning from here is say 0.3 right but i made the move from here to come here right but here i had thought my probability of winning was let us say 0.6 right i thought my probability of winning was 0.6 right but then i looked at my next states and i found that the best one was 0.3 somehow right so i went there right but now since the best i can do from here is 0.3 me saying 0.6 here there is something wrong right so i should probably decrease the probability of winning from here right so why could it be why could it have happened that i thought that was 0.6 but the best among the next was 0.3 maybe the other branch that you had explored the 0.4 that was fully explored and all it all of that was decreased to 0.4 oh, the thing is so that whenever i came to came through this part right maybe i won before right the, the it so happened that when i went through like this right initially i would have gone through like this and played the game right and the examples i drew i might have actually won some of those games right so i would have changed this to 0.6 right but it's possible for me to get here by playing a different sequence of moves also right so for example to come here right i could have put the x first here and then here or i could have put the x like i did here i put the x first here and then here that right? either way i would I, i could have reached this position right so uh, there are many combinations in which i could have reached the same positions right it just to be nice to these guys right to reach here there are different orders in which i could have put the zeros and the x's right here we are showing a specific order the zero was first put here then put here that the x was first put here then put here it could very well be i put the x first here and the o first here and then i put the x here and the o here right there could have multiple ways in this thing was reached reach, right so sometimes when i play those games right i lost right sometimes when i play these games i won therefore it turns out that for due to some random fluctuations right so sometimes i win when i go through this specific point and therefore i have a higher evaluation of winning right but when i went through the other paths i had a lower evaluation of winning right but we know that really doesn't matter what path you went through in tic tac toe right once you reach that point right what is going to happen further is determined only by that point right so what i can do now is take this point 3 right you should update that point 6 down down so i i'm very confident here i think i'll win with the probability of 0.6 right but the best probability i have from the next stage is 0.3 therefore here i should not be so confident right how far down until 0.3 or ah good point uh, that depends on how stochastic your game is right so if your game has a lot of variability then you don't want to make a complete uh, you know commitment to 0.3 so you might want to say okay now let me move it little bit towards 0.3 right but if it's uh, more or less a deterministic game 
then you can say okay yeah 0.3 yes sure let me go to all the way to 0.3 it depends on the nature of the game we'll talk about these issues later yeah but how far down is a tricky thing right so you're saying that calling is a tree misleading uh, yeah it's misleading it's called game tree usually but it's a game graph in this case yeah 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 so uh, is, is, is it clear when I mean, this is this is an instance of temporal difference learning so how will i use the uh, the thing to update is this is called temporal difference learning okay so there's one other uh, thing which i should uh, mention here right uh, if i always take the move that which i think is the best move right now right let's let's talk about it Let, i i start tableau rasa i have never played tic tac toe before right so i play the game i play it once i get i get to the end i win so now what i do i go back right whether i'm using temporal difference learning or waiting till the end updating whatever it is i change the value of all the moves i have made in this particular game right so the next time i come to a board position what am i going to do i look at all possible outcomes everything except the one that i have played will have a zero right and the one that i have played will have something slightly higher than 0 i'm going to take that right in fact it will be like how many of you watched the movie groundhog day it will be like groundhog day i'll be playing i'll be playing the same game again and again because that's what happened to give me a win in the first time around right that but that might not be the best way to play this right so i need to explore right so i need to explore multiple options right so i should not be always playing the best <coughs> best move right and i should not always be playing the best move i need to do some amount of exploration so that i can figure out if there are better moves than what i think is currently the best move right and so in tic tac toe there is inherently some kind of noise if your opponent is random right but if your opponent is not random and if your opponent is also playing a fixed rule and if you are playing greedy then you will be just playing a very very small fraction of the game tree and uh, you wouldn't have explored the rest of the outcomes right so you have to do some amount of things at random so that you learn more about the game right so here is a question for you when i am estimating this probabilities of winning right let us say i have reached here i look down right and the action that gives me the highest probability of winning say gives me a probability of say 0.8 right but i want to explore right so i take an action that gives me a probability say 0.4 okay so i'll go from here to another action that has a probability 0.4 right another board position that has a probability of 0.4 of winning so should i use this 0.4 to update this probability or not no why have to because it's part of the learning experience huh? you haven't won or lost the game round you wait that you are questioning the whole td idea you already won with that particular sequence and you are now you are exploring it so you shouldn't update it when you are exploring you should probably wait for the end round and and or not not just ignore the exploration yeah okay any any other answer you have to update it because you are learning that move whether it will be a good move or a bad move will be found out i have to update the value of that move i agree do i update the value of winning from the previous board position was the question so that point 4 i'll have to change right but do i change the point 8 that was the question the point 8 was a probability of winning from here right i look uh, or whatever was the probability let's say i had a probability of winning of point 6 from here i look at the bottom and the best <coughs> probability of winning says point 8 but then i take because i'm exploring i take an action that has a probability of winning of 0.4 right the question is do i go back and change the 0.6 towards 0.4 or do i leave the 0.6 as it is unless this goes over 0.8 sorry unless this probability of this current thing goes over 0.8 that won't go right i'm exploring right i mean this is be, will be necessarily be less than 0.8 this will be 0.4 that will be 0.6 so the question here is see one way of arguing about this is to say that hey if i'm playing to win right i'll play the best action from here right and the best action says 0.8 therefore i should not penalize it for the bad action which is 0.4 which i did to learn more about the system 
Right? That's one way of thinking about it. Another way of arguing is to say that, hey, no, no, this is how I am actually behaving now. Right? So I should give you the probability of winning about, uh, about the current behavior policy. Right? It should not be some other uh, ideal policy. It should be about what I am behaving currently and therefore I should update it. Right? So which one is correct? First or the second? You don't know what the second is. You would say the second one. Great. So all of you can go write that in your homework answers. Okay, I think this is one of the homework questions as well. Right? Are you looking at the question? I know you're browsing, you're not paying attention to me, but can you look at the questions as well? You don't have a network here, eh? I see our network doesn't work. Okay. There should be a Wi-Fi access point called ICSR Studio or something, no? Okay. Fine. Do you have the question? Do you have the book offline? Okay. Fine. Yeah, I, but I do believe this is one of the questions, right? So otherwise, uh, make up a question and write the answer to that. So we'll, we'll we'll make sure that this is one of the questions. Yeah, but this is something. This is, this is like I said. Right? I'm going to ask you to think about the whole tic-tac-toe thing. And many of these answers have relevance later on. In fact, there are two different algorithms. One does option one, one does option two. Right? So, so there's just no right answer or wrong answer. Right? It, answer is? It depends. Depends. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. So, that's, these are different things that you can think about in this. But I, now I told you about two different ways of learning with tic-tac-toe. One, wait till the end and figure out what the probabilities will be. The other one is? Keep adapting this as you go along, right? In both cases, you'll have to explore. That's the tricky part here. In both cases, you have to explore. Otherwise, you'll not learn about the entire game. So this is where the explore exploit thingy comes in. Okay? Yeah. So how do you know at what point to stop exploring and choosing the best? Great. Great question. And different algorithms deal with it different way. That's one of the crucial uh, questions that you have to answer in. Uh, uh, in RL. So it's called the explore exploit dilemma, right? Um, so you have to explore to find out which is the best action, right? And you have to exploit whatever knowledge you have gathered, right? Uh, and uh, you have to act according to the best uh, observations already made, right? So this is called exploitation, right? So the key, one of the key questions is when do you know you have explored enough? Right? Should I explore now or should I exploit now? Right? This is called the explore exploit dilemma, right? And uh, a slightly simpler version of uh, reinforcement learning uh, called the bandit problems. Okay, some uh, colorfully called bandit problems. Yeah, of course, he's an expert on bandit problems. Yeah, you can. Uh, uh, the, the bandit problems encapsulate this explore exploit uh, dilemma. My God, a lot of people are turning and looking at you, Shubho. Know, and uh, so we'll, this is the next chapter we're going to look at. So probably in the next class, I'll start uh, plunging into bandit uh, problems in more detail. Uh, but so this will ignore a whole bunch of other things like the delayed rewards, you know, the sequential decisions and other things. But even in the absence of all of these other complications, right, even if I say that your, all your problem is you have to take an action and you'll get a reward. Okay? Your goal is to pick the action that gives the highest reward. I'll give you 10 actions. You have to pick the action that gives you the highest reward, right? But the problem is, you don't know what is the the probability distribution from which these <coughs> rewards are coming, right? So you'll have to do some exploration. I, I have to actually do every action at least once, okay, to know what will be the reward, even if they are deterministic, right? So I can't I can't say which is the best action before I try every action at least once. If it is deterministic, it's fine. I can just try every action once and I know what is the payoff, right? But if it is stochastic, I have to try every action multiple times, right? How many times do you have to try it depends on the variability of the distribution, right? So these are the uh, subtle questions which we will talk about as we look at the next chapter in the, uh, the first chapter in the book, uh, the first uh, uh, real chapter in the book, okay? There's an intro chapter which talks about tic-tac-toe and a whole bunch of other things. And uh, yeah, so we have to stop soon. I'm not sure whether I want to do all of this. 
yeah so we'll come back and talk about uh, all of this uh, later right so i i thought i would uh, uh, not uh, spend enough time talking about the general background of rln applications so i put in a little bit more slides i typically do this on the board right so i'll do this on the board when i get to chapter 3 right and so one one thing which i wanted to tell you was uh, this right uh, there are uh, you know two classes of algorithms that we will be talking about so one of them is based on what's called dynamic programming right uh, so dynamic programming uh, how many of you know what dynamic programming is I expect at least 23 hands up. <laughs> and I have a mechanical engineers putting their hands up, not the CS guys. Really? You don't know what dynamic programming is? Huh? Something wrong with your hand then. Okay, fine. So, what, what the essential idea behind dynamic, I, I'll talk, again, I'll talk as, as usual with other things. We'll uh, dwell on this in uh, larger detail. Uh, the essential uh, idea behind dynamic programming is you will be using some kind of a repeated structure in the problem, right? So, and to solve the problem more efficiently, right? Suppose I have, I have a solution that I can uh, give for a problem of say size n, right? Then I'll try to see if I can use that for defining the solution for the problem of size n plus 1, right? So, some kind of a repeated substructure in the problems, right? Uh, the very, very rough way of describing what dynamic programming is, right? Uh, so, for example, uh, one way of thinking about dynamic programming is I have this game tree, right? So, I look at the values of winning or, or the expectations of winning from all of these steps, right? I will use these in order to compute the value of winning or the, the probability of winning from this state, right? So, if you think about it, if, if from here, if I am going to take say n steps, from here, how many steps would you expect me to take? n minus 1 steps, right? So, I look at the probability of winning when I, when I have only n minus 1 steps left, right? I will estimate that first. I will use that solution for estimating the probability of winning when I have n steps left, right? So, that is essentially the idea behind dynamic programming. And so, what we will do is, uh, well, we will talk about how do you use dynamic programming to solve reinforcement learning problems, right? And then, we will talk about uh, various reinforcement learning methods which are essentially online approximate dynamic programming you know. So, they are uh, they use dynamic programming ideas, but they do not have any knowledge of the system dynamics right. So, the P, I, I'll, the P and R will other things become clearer later. And uh, so, all you do now is instead of having the entire outcome and using that for estimating the probability of winning here right. I am going to just use one step that I take through the tree right I use just what happens in this one step I will use that in order to update the probability of winning here right. So, instead of using the entire outcome right as in dynamic programming in reinforcement learning methods we will be using samples that you are getting through the state space ok. This is the TD method in the other method I explained to in uh, for tic tac toe what would you do your sample will run all the way to the end right and you will use that to update. So, that is uh, the two different ways of using samples here. Yeah. So, uh, so, in this uh, in this case uh, we have uh, the updating of s of t will be determined by the value in s t plus 1 yeah. right. Yeah. So, the, the value of s t plus 1 should be computed first. Yeah. And so, so, since s t plus 1 depends on s t plus 2 again that should be computed first. So, would not this be the same thing as exploring the whole the all the way down and then computing so the value. So, let us say let us if you are doing it for the first time right. The first time down the tree, there will be no updates actually, because st plus 1 will also be 0, st will also be 0. The first time you go down, there will be no updates, but once you reach an end, then from there you will start updating the previous day. So, the next time you go down the tree, then it will keep going further up. Hmm. Whether you won the game or lost the game, I actually am taking the exact outcome that happened in that particular trial, right? At that particular game, and I use that to change my probabilities, right? But here I am not just taking the outcome of that particular game, right? I am looking at the expected value of winning from the next board position, right? So if I wait till all the way here and I say I won. 
and I take this and update ST, then I'll be only updating it with the fact whether I won or not. Okay. But if I'm updating it from ST plus 1, see I could have reached ST plus 1 multiple ways before. Right. When I'm doing the updation from ST plus 1, it's essentially the average accumulated over all the previous trials that I'll be using. Right. So if I play all the way to the end and update it, it will be with a 1 or a 0. But ST plus 1 could be anywhere between 1 and 0, depending on what's the probability of winning. So I'll be using that value for updation. So that's the crucial difference. Right, so there are many different solution methods. So there are all these uh, which are called temporal difference methods. So these are all different algorithms, TD, Lambda, Q-learning, SARSA, actor critic, so on and so forth. Right? And then there is this whole search of uh, algorithms which are called policy search algorithms. And then there is uh, dynamic programming. So we will actually look at uh, each of these uh, classes of algorithms in the, uh, in the next few lectures. Right? This, uh, so these are all uh, essentially uh, mostly from the textbook except uh, policy search algorithms uh, which I will be covering from other material. Right? And there are a whole bunch of other applications for RL. Right? So you could, uh, they're all over the place as you could see. Optimal control, optimization, combinatorial optimization, OR, psychology, neuroscience. So that's one of the reasons I was asking is there anyone from biotech? Because uh, biotech people do use reinforcement learning a lot. And usually there are one or two people in, in, in the RL class, so I'm just really surprised. Or maybe that is, there was a biotech registrant according to the academic website. I mean, they just gave up in CS36 and went back. I don't know, right? So here is the, the most uh, recent uh, hot thing that comes from, came from RL, right? Uh, more game playing. And for a change, it's not from IBM, right? It's from Google, uh, but the company uh, that actually uh, built the first uh, this uh, arcade game playing engine was called DeepMind and as soon as DeepMind built a successful engine Google bought them right and so now it's Google DeepMind uh, but it's, it's a separate entity right it's uh, it's not part of Google it's Google DeepMind operates out of London and it, they're doing all kinds of interesting stuff uh, many of the hot uh, advances the very recent advances in the last year or so in uh, uh, reinforcement learning seem to be coming out of DeepMind. Uh, so what they did was, uh, how many of you know about these Atari games, right? Everyone knows about Atari games. People are getting tired. Really? No one has played Pac-Man? Ah, yeah. How about, how about uh, Pong? Breakout? Space Invaders? Come on. Yeah, anyway. So what uh, happened was, there's this uh, team in the University of Alberta. Okay, which put out this, uh, they, what they call the ALE, the Arcade uh, Learning, Atari, the Atari Learning Environment or Arcade Learning Environment, uh, which essentially uh, they allowed uh, computers to play these games, right, these Atari games. And uh, what the DeepMind fellows came up with is a reinforcement learning agent that learned to play these games from scratch, right, just by looking at the screen. Okay, that's all the input it was getting, just the pixels from the screen, the raw pixels from the screen were given as inputs to it. It used a very complex neural network, so it's a, it's a deep, deep learning, uh, deep network, right? And it is considered one of the hardest uh, learning problems solved by a computer. And I think I believe it's a, uh, one uh, the only computational uh, reinforcement learning paper ever <coughs> to appear in Nature, right? So usually it's very hard for uh, uh, non-natural science people to publish in Nature, right? It's kind of obvious, right? It's usually hard for the computer science folks to publish in Nature, but uh, uh, this was uh, uh, toted, uh, touted as a, a next step in trying to understand how humans process inputs, blah, 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 things, all kinds of marketing jargon, right? Uh, but more importantly than anything else about this, it's reproducible. So I told you about, uh, I think that's a warning sign for me to stop. So I told you about uh, the helicopter, right? So that's basically Stanford and Berkeley or the two people who get the helicopter to fly. I told you about the, the backgammon player, it's like Jerry Tesaro, is the one person who gets the backgammon player to work, right? Uh, partly because all the input features he uses in there are proprietary, but partly because it's a very hard problem to solve, right? What is the amazing thing about this Atari game uh, engine is that uh, these guys have released a code, right? You can, if you have enough powerful GPUs, right, you can set it up here and get it to play and get a reasonably uh, working uh, engine. Right, that plays, plays Atari games. That's the amazing thing about it, that it's reproducible. 
as opposed to many of the other things, uh, other success stories, <coughs> other success stories we have had in the past. So I do believe I have just one more slide after this. So let's see if this will work. Okay. So if you are any doubts, the green one is the learning agent. No, no, this just sped up for you to see. I mean, it's not like <laughs> the game is progressing at the same rate. But you can see the, the scores though. Mind you, it was not given a reward. Okay, it is just given the screen. Okay, never, never got a reward for winning. You have to understand that the pixels on the top are rewarding. And if you give it rewards, it becomes cheating, right? Or is it? Yeah. Which is what they did. They did. They did add a game over, which is, which the the ALE purists consider as cheating. But uh, yeah, they did add a game over sign. Yeah. So the longer you keep it going, the better it is, basically. I think this is getting boring. Right, so it's it's learnt, yeah. <coughs> so this is a sea quest. So you have to swim and then sink down, get some things and come up. So Sequest is a game that it never learned to do greatly on though. Sequest is not something which it learned to solve well. So there are a few games like this. So when they initially published the Nature paper, I think uh, they had like like 45 or 46 out of the 50 ALE games. Uh, they were able to play well, and uh, I think in 43 of them it had better than human performance. And I think the current state is they have like one game that doesn't play well, right? And they have better than human performance in like 48 of those games or something. So which is, this is amazing if you think about it, right? So these are all a lot of references, uh, but we'll be using uh, the Sutton and Bartow textbook. Uh, the second edition, we there is a pre-release copy which uh, Rich Sutton is uh, continuously updating on his web page, right? And uh, there's a very very short introduction to uh, uh, reinforcement learning in Tom Mitchell's book, and there's a chapter in Russell and Norwig. And uh, if you are interested in looking at the, the neuroscience uh, perspective of uh, reinforcement learning or the history of how uh, behavioral psychology models evolve to temporal difference learning, uh, you can look at Diane and Abbott. Uh, that's one chapter on reinforcement learning. Uh, you don't have to understand the neuroscience to understand the RL chapter. So don't get put off by the title of the book. Right? And then uh, the more mathematically uh, well grounded uh, introduction to reinforcement learning would be from Bersikas and Sitsiklis. So apart from this we will use one book uh, which is uh, Markov decision processes by Puterman. Right? We will use certain chapters from Puterman and uh, that is just for us to understand uh, MDPs uh, better, Markov decision processes better.